Everything's good. All right, folks. So once again, welcome, and uh, let's get started. So a little bit about me, about me first. My name is Ahmed Yusuf. I'm a mobile developer at Shopify. I've been uh, building apps since 2013, and the reason I got into app development was I'm just very excited about using technology to solve everyday problems. And uh, the first app that I ever built was a smart home controller that I just tried to control my house using my smartphone. Uh, then I built a chat app, and things just kind of got rolling from that point. And I'm always looking out for ways to make this process of creating an app and bringing it out to people as efficient, as effective as possible. And this is how I ended up here talking to you guys about Flutter. But first, tell me a little bit about you. How many Flutter developers do we have in the house? Can we get a show of hands? All right, not bad. Uh, how many native developers? Android? Okay, any iOS developers? <laughs> Pretty good. Any desktop or web developers? So web first, desktop. Great, it's great to, to finally see uh, some desktop developers you know, join us. Uh, we're going to start from the zero level until you understand exactly the problem that we're trying to solve, regardless of the platform. So this is going to apply to all devs, whether you come from a desktop background, a mobile background, a web background. Once again, Flutter does create an app for all these platforms, but at the same time, the core concept that we're going to cover today is just, it's, gonna, it's, uh, it's across the board. You're going to need this knowledge regardless of the platform that you're working with. You're going to understand the hardest topic in Flutter. State management is by far the hardest thing developers have to deal with. If you're a beginner, you're going to know exactly how to start on the right foot, uh, which solution to pick, how to build your app for the long term from the very beginning. If you're a seasoned expert, you're going to have more tools in your tool belt. And whether you decide to change your existing projects or your next projects, you, you will know exactly which state management solution to use by the end of this talk. Any app out there consists of mainly two things, a user interface and some sort of data. We use our phones, our tablets, our computers in the user interface to manipulate the data somehow. Whenever we manipulate the data, we expect the data to be updated on our screen. But at the end of the day, those are the two main components, a data source, which is what you see on the left, or state of your app, and a user interface. And what we're doing today is we're going to discuss the relationship between them and how to create, uh, how, to, how to write code so that the interaction between the user interface and your data is seamless and expandable. And your data can be coming from any source. It can be coming from a database, an API, uh, share preferences, really any source that you want to connect to a user interface. There might be some middle layers between the user interface and the data, but at the end of the day, it's basically UI data. The UI shows you the data, it manipulates the data, and it gets updated when the data gets changed. So it's pretty safe to say that the user interface is a function of state. It's a way to display your state or your data on a screen, and it's a way to uh, manipulate that data. That's how we have this relationship of, or a function. So UI equals function of state. Remember that because it's going to come in handy throughout the rest of this talk and also so we can develop more concepts on this. To make a app, whether it's a mobile app or a desktop app, traditionally you would have to use two languages. Some kind of language that you would use your business logic, so that could be Java, Kotlin, or Swift, and some other markup language. This could be XML, HTML, and, uh, and CSS. And you combine these two languages, you create your user experience, you create your data logic, and you have an app. This has advantages, but it also has disadvantages. Obviously, it's, it creates a separation between the UI and the data, which is a good thing, but it also creates a disconnect. Um, so you should be able to use editors to drag and drop components into your UI, but at the same time, if you, uh, there's a disconnect between the UI and the business logic. And this becomes more clear during testing and in any situation wherever you run into bugs, you literally have two places to look at. You have the XML or HTML, and you have your JavaScript or Kotlin or Swift or any other native uh, language that you're working with. So Facebook comes along and changes the game forever. They come up with a concept called declarative UI. 
they, uh, what they did was they took JavaScript, they took XML, and a little bit of CSS, they put them all together, and they created what's called JSX. And this is what's used for React and React Native. Any React Native developers in the house? <laughs> Zero. Interesting. All right. So that's, this is actually the story of how JSX what came into life. It's a combination of XML, uh, JavaScript, and CSS to allow you to just have one, uh, one language that you use to build your entire application. Whether that's the business logic or the UI, it's all going to be in JSX. And if there's any issues that you have, there's only one place that you need to look instead of having to work with a markup language and a business logic language. So this concept was called declarative UI. It was a brand new concept, and uh, it removes the gap between UI and data, it has a lot of advantages, and once again, it kind of changed the game forever, and a lot of different um, platforms start to adopt the same idea as we're about to see right now. But before that, let me just give you an example. Let's say you want to create a component. So this could be a text box or an image or a slider of some kind. Uh, the way to do that would be using your native code rather than XML. So you can specify the size, the color, the specifications of all these components. And once again, you'll just be using, in the case of React or React Native, you'll be using JSX. And you'll compose your UI right from the same place that you are building your business logic. In the parallel world of Flutter and Google and Dart, they did the same thing, but they wanted to start absolutely from scratch. They figured a lot of these technologies were not really built for this kind of thing that we're trying to do, which is declarative UI. So instead, they opted to go with a language that's more suited for this kind of thing. Um, so Dart is the language of choice, and Dart was initially released as an alternative and improvement to JavaScript. But they did the same thing. They used, uh, they used Dart to create a declarative UI, uh, which is equivalent to JSX. That's like the, the equivalent of JSX in the Flutter world. But it's not just that. Across all native platforms, declarative UI became more of a, just a permanent concept. So for example, for Kotlin, you have Jetpack Compose. Combined with the capabilities of the, uh, of the Kotlin language, you can do the same thing. You can start building your components right from within, within your business logic. Uh, the same thing for Swift UI. Swift UI follows the same concept, uh, which is which allows you to compose your code using Swift. So in the beginning, there was some resistance to this idea of declarative UI, but once again, it's now integrated into all native frameworks, and it's pretty much the way to move forward from here because it's becoming part of not just native frameworks but also cross-platform uh, frameworks. So what I need you to remember so far is that UI is a function of state. As we just saw, you have a UI of some kind which manipulates the state or displays the state. And the other thing we want, I want you to remember is this new concept of declarative UI, where you create your UI in the same place that you're creating your business logic. And it's no longer two different places where you put your XML or your HTML in one side and your business logic, which could be Kotlin, Swift, or Java, or any other language, in another side. Let's take a moment to define state. So we, we want to talk about state management. What exactly is state? I mean, it sounds like some kind of uh, like a, a very generic word. Well, state really just means data. The state of your app is the data within your app. And whenever that data changes, we want to update the UI. So if I have some kind of to-do list, for example, and I change the to-do list from my browser, I expect that if I access the same to-do list from my phone to get the updated result. If I make a change here, it should reflect there. And that's, that's kind of the, uh, the idea of state management. You want your data to be up to date across different devices, and you want an easy and accessible way to reach that data from the UI without having to put in a lot of boilerplate code or, to, or for the complexity uh, of maintaining that app to increase as your app gets bigger. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to manage our data in a way that makes it easy to present, easy to modify, and most importantly, when it does get modified by a different source, that it would get updated on your existing device. This data can be in the form of variables or data structures that come from different sources. Things like age, things like name or title, these are all 
parts of your application. They can live on the local database, they can live in an API, and what you need to do at the end of the day is to display that data in your UI in a way that kind of makes sense. And once again, whenever it gets updated, you want it to be updated on your screen as well. Uh, so your data is what's called the business domain of your application. In the case of a to-do list, your business domain is the to-do list, the app that has the list of items that you want to uh, to do or check off and so on. So the data of your app is the state of your app. So to be more specific, state management equals the ability to read, write, and update the UI whenever the data gets updated. So we're trying to do those three things. Everything we're gonna talk about tonight is going to achieve those three objectives in a way that's scalable, it's easy, and you can implement it across different applications. So how can we do that? First, let's talk about our two main goals. We wanna be able to access the data easily, and once again, whenever that data changes, we wanna be notified of the changes across all our devices. So this is, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do with state management. I'm sure you've heard this before, everything in Flutter is a widget. We have stateless and stateful widgets. A stateless widget generally has no state, which means it's fixed. It could be like text or a picture or perhaps a button. It does one thing and that thing does not change. That thing could be displaying, once again, graphics or text. And because it doesn't change, it's, called, it's what's called stateless. Whereas if your data changes, you wanna use what's called a stateful widget because for example, a slider or an animation on the screen. It doesn't have the same state across its life cycle. Uh, maybe in the beginning, it's at one position, and then if you move the slider, it's in another position. So a stateless widget, remember, it just basically means a fixed widget of some kind that does not change. A stateful widget represents a widget that is based on some data, and that data could be from any source. It could be from an API, it could be from the user, uh, and yeah, so these are the two main components or two main widgets that we've been discussing with Flutter. I would say um, the, the majority of your work is gonna be in, these, in this domain of these two widgets. So how can we manage the data inside a stateless or a stateful widget? So as we just said, if your data changes, you need to use what's called a stateful widget. And let's take an example of an app with this hierarchy. So let's say this is our app. This is like our material app. Or I should say like this is the parent widget of every screen in your app. So this, this is like your app. This is maybe the home screen. Uh, and then maybe you can log in and this is like the logged in state. Uh, maybe this is the logged out state. And uh, maybe let's say this is like the profile screen. So this is like the hierarchy of your app, starting with your entry point up until wherever you want to end up. Let's say you have a scenario where you want to transfer data from the widget at the top. So let's, let's say this is your material app. In Flutter we call this the material app. This is the entry point of your app. Let's say there's some data here and we want to access it all the way down here. There's two common ways to do that. You can pass it on as a model from constructor to constructor and then from one screen to the other you create an object, you pass it to the next screen and then you just kind of have to maintain that. So. Or the other thing you can do is you can create some kind of repository and store your data in that repository and then access it from anywhere in your app. And this is what's called dependency injection. So these are kind of like the two traditional common ways uh, to, to manage our state. Uh, but is this practical? Well, for a small number of screens, I guess it's okay. If you have like three screens and you pass data between three screens, you're fine. You're not really gonna you know, have to do a lot of work. You don't have to do a lot of maintaining. Uh, you should be fine. However, as your app gets more complex, let's say you have 10 screens, 20 screens, 100 screens, things are gonna to start to get messy pretty fast. If you wanna pass data from the beginning of your app all the way to, for example, the profile screen, and let's say that means you have to log in, you have to access certain parts of the app, and then you end up in the login screen. If that data has to go through all those screens or all those widgets, then you're gonna put in a lot of boilerplate code. And this is what mobile developers generally have to deal with. This is why earlier we mentioned that this is the biggest challenge mobile developers have to deal with, managing the data within your app. How do you pass it from one part of the app to another part of the app? 
is this really the best way? Well, what are some of the solutions provided by Flutter that can make this process easier to think about, to maintain, and to build your apps in a way that's just not confusing? Well, there's, I liked you. There's a third type of widgets. We talked about stateless, we talked about stateful. There's actually a third type of widgets that was added into the Flutter SDK to address this problem specifically. Can anybody guess what is the name of that widget? State. Okay. Any other answers? Inherited widget. Okay. Class. Class. Inherited widget is the correct answer. <laughs> That's exactly the right answer. Inherited widget has one job. It has to carry the data and make it available to any widget that inherits from that parent or root widget. Inheritance is the idea that you inherit some properties from a parent of some kind. In our case, our parent will be an inherited widget. And if you have the ability to inherit some properties or specific properties uh, built into your system, then you have that data available as long as you are a child of an inherited widget. So inheritance, to summarize, allows different widgets to inherit different properties. So you can put your state in the beginning of the app. So this would be your inherited widget. And then any widget within that tree, if it wants to access the data from this inherited widget, it'll be like, hey, can I get like the color of this? And then the inherited widget will be like, yeah, sure, here you go. Because it's built in that way and it's specifically designed to deal with this problem. This is what's called lifting state up. You're lifting the state of your application from all these bottom widgets all the way up to your inherited widget, and then your data becomes here and becomes available to all these widgets across your app. So for example, you want to know if you're logged in or logged out. That data could be present in the inherited widget, and then based on that, you can either show like a home screen or like a login screen. So that's what inherited widget does. It lifts up the data or the state of your app to a place where it's accessible by all the widgets within your app. So this definitely has advantages, right? It's at the roots of your app. Uh, all the widgets beneath an inherited widget have access to the data provided by that widget. So you don't have to worry about passing the data around anymore. You don't have to pass it from constructor to constructor. Let's say I specify a certain color for my theme. Let's say that color is red. Any one of these widgets that want to query or ask for that color, they can just be like, hey, inherited widget, what's my color? And it can just go, well, it's red. And in this way, you basically have, you have one central source of truth for your data in your app, and it just takes care of all the confusion. Inherited widget is built right into the SDK of Flutter. So you can start using this right away without importing any packages. Uh, you can use this to build apps as sophisticated as you want. And you, once again, you don't need any third party packages. You can start working with this right away. And once again, you can have different kinds of data. So perhaps this widget wants like the color of the theme. Uh, maybe this one wants like the secondary color or like the background color or something completely different like whether the user is logged in or not. So it's not like you have just one inherited widget, although you could have one inherited widget with all the data and then selectively pick it. But what I'm trying to say is it's very flexible and it's a great tool that you can use to pass data around in your app or to do state management without having to worry about how you pass it from one place to another. But this is the very basic, the most basic way to do it, as we're about to find out. So for example, let's say the color, let's say there's a color of red that we want to access. Let's say we want to access from a button that's all the way in your login screen, right? Well, as long as this button is part of a screen that's part of a hierarchy that is inheriting from the inherited widget, then this button can query this inherited widget and it can just be like, what color do I use? And it's gonna be like, red is the answer. And this can be provided to different widgets. So maybe your login button needs that color. Maybe your scaffold, which is like the structure of your app, needs to query for the same data or different data. It'll just provide it from the inherited widget with no problem. So any widget can request data. But are there any other advantages? 
I mean, we can do this with shared preferences or database, right? I can just save all my data to a database, and then any query, any widget that wants to access it can just go to the database and be like, hey, give me the color. And, and the database will be like, yeah, it's red. But that's not just it. What if the color changes? What if it becomes blue? Maybe you set it from a back end or you set it from like another uh, platform that you're accessing. We want that data to be updated and to notify the, all the listeners when that data changes. So you don't just want to have the ability to access it, you also want to be notified whenever that data changes, and that's when inherited widgets really shine. We want to do what's called reactive programming, or auto-binding of the data to our widgets. So if the data changes, our widget change. And if we do something to the widget to modify the data, the data could change as well. So that's the main advantage of inherited widget that's not provided by any of the existing solutions uh, today, like a database or shared preferences, or even the backend. This is done by implementing what's called a change notifier. There's a method within the inherited widget, and when you override it, you basically put in the data that you need to be modified, or, or excuse me, the listeners that, that need to know about this data will be, mo will be notified by this change notifier method, and then they're gonna be like, by the way, the color is no longer red, now it's blue. So then it should know to, like back in the example of the tree, for example, the button now should update its color from red to blue if that color changes. And once again, th this is where inherited widgets really shine. Inherited widget is one of the most important features that's built right into the Flutter SDK. This is kind of like foundational. All the state management solutions, or I should say most of them, use uh, inherited widget, widget in their implementation. But whether you use a third-party package that uses it or not, this widget is available for you to use right now. So if this is good enough for you, you can use it. But there's more robust solutions that build on this idea, as we're about to find out. Who's familiar with any of these in the, from the Flutter world? So theme of or media query of? Great, which one are you familiar with? Media query, theme? Navigator? Great. Awesome. Well, in fact, all of these patterns actually use inherited widget under the hood. So you've been using this the whole time and basically they use inherited widget, widget without, I, mean, I didn't know, but this is actually something that's once again built into a lot of patterns that do state management. It's like the most basic way to do state management in a way that's efficient and in a way that keeps your UI up to date regardless of where you are within your app. So these are like popular patterns. Uh, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of Flutter developers work with them, and it's important to remember that they're based on the same idea of an inherited widget. But are there any disadvantages? Is there any limitation to inherited widget? Seems to me like if this does everything that we need to do, we should just use this. We don't really need to finish this talk. We just use inherited widget everywhere, and then a problem is gonna be solved forever. Well, these widgets, these inherited widgets, they can only carry data. They cannot share it, they cannot manage it, they cannot interact with it, they can only provide it. So, for example, when we had a parent or, or the top widget be an inherited widget with a color, it cannot modify it, it cannot do anything to it. It can just hold it and make it available. So, this really starts to become a problem when you're working with what's called streams. Anybody here familiar with streams in Flutter? Great, that's way better than I expected. So streams are a very powerful component of Flutter. They basically give you a, the ability to do asynchronous programming by just listening to events. We're gonna discuss it in detail in just a bit. Uh, but before we do that, I wanna tell you why you cannot really use streams with inherited widget out of the box. You have to do some extra work. Think of a stream as like a, a hose or like a channel where data comes in from one end and exits from the other end. And if you don't close hose or the tap, you're gonna get memory leaks, and then you're gonna get crashes, and you're just gonna lose performance. So unfortunately, inherited widgets are not made to handle streams because they don't have a way to close the hose or the tap or to do specifically what's called disposing the stream. So if you wanna do that, you would have to do, you would have to implement your own stateful widget and within that widget, you're gonna to have to manually close the stream whenever you don't need it, 
and you have to uh, do all the work that needs to be done to maintain a stream from within that stateful widget. So right out of the box, if you're not using streams, but likely you, you will and you should because it's a powerful component and it's just part of the Flutter SDK that makes your life so much easier, then inherited widgets will require extra work by implementing another stateful widget to deal with that. What you can do is you can actually use a stateful widget and stateful widgets have a method called dispose. You can override that method and then within that method, whenever the, the stateful widget gets disposed, it will also dispose your stream. So this is like a safe way to use inherited widgets combined with a stateful widget to work with your streams. Once again, a stream is like a hose. On one end we get data, on the other end we get, uh, the data comes in from one end, exits from the other end. But if you don't close that hose or that channel when you don't use it, you're gonna start having memory leaks. Let's talk a little bit about streams and darts. There's no avoiding streams. If you wanna be a pro at Dart, at, at Flutter, which is built on Dart, you're gonna have to understand streams. They are powerful and necessary for doing asynchronous programming. They're just gonna make your life easier. So just accept the fact, they're not that hard to learn, as we're gonna find out. This is like an example of a stream. It's like a pipeline, data comes in from one part, and then it's handled perhaps by displaying it to a UI. So it's just like a basic way of explaining it. Uh, you get events coming in, and then you decide what you're gonna do with those events. As we talked about, inherited widgets, they can handle, they can like receive the data, but if those events are no longer needed, it, it cannot shut it down. So it's just gonna lead to a crash. Another thing about streams is that streams can, can actually modify, we can use streams to modify the incoming data. So we can apply some kind of operation to our incoming stream. Let's say we have a stream of letters or data and we want to go from lowercase to uppercase. This, this is not about state management, this is more about just how streams work and just to give you an idea of why you need to use them and how, and how to use them because they're very powerful. So you can apply an operation or transformation of some kind to those streams. You can wrap an item in a wrapper class. So for example, I can be receiving items of a certain type and then I can apply a certain transformation, maybe add a wrapper class to it, and then on the output, I'll be getting another type. This is an example that we talked about. So for example, you could be getting a stream of letters and you can apply a transformation of two upper. So you get lowercase letters on one end, and the other end you get the same letters but two uppercase. This is just to give you an idea of like what streams are for. It's like a, a stream of data, and you can do something with that data. Another thing that's very powerful with streams is that you can use multiple sources and combine them. So let's say your data comes, some of your data comes from Firebase, some of your data comes from MySQL, and you want to combine it into an output. Streams would be a perfect candidate for that use case. You can combine both streams into your output and start using that output right away. So I hope by now you realize there's no way around streams. You're just gonna have to start using them in your app because they're like a modern way to deal with incoming data in your app. If you wanna be a pro, you're gonna have to start using them. All right, let's tell a quick story about Facebook. Facebook had a notorious bug. Every time they fixed it, it would come back. I'm sure a lot of people in this room have experienced it, although it's been fixed recently, so if you only joined Facebook recently, then you probably ha haven't experienced it. It has to do with a notification counter. You get a notification on your phone or your tablet, it says you have one message or friend request. You check your phone, nothing. Every time Facebook would fix this bug, it would just come back. No matter what they did, it would always come back. And once again, this bug it was pretty common. Like I, I remember running into this, uh, getting a notification on my phone and then checking and realizing, oh, I've already checked this notification. So basically, I, I checked my phone for nothing. So. Every time they fix it, or they think they fixed it, it would come back. Until Bill Fisher, an engineer at Facebook, shows up and he says, you guys are approaching this the wrong way. Facebook was originally built on what's called the MVC pattern. Anybody familiar with it? Model view controller. So another variations are MVC, MVP, MVVM. The idea is basically the same. Let me show you what an MVC pattern looks like, but also they were using what's called backbone.js. Has anybody used backbone.js before? 
Oh, awesome. <laughs> it's kind of an ancient framework, so I'm kind of surprised that uh, you know, we have people now who've used it. So this is like a basic structure. So it used to be an MVC. So this is your model, this is your view, this is your controller, MVC. And it was working with backbone.js. This was the original architecture that was built, that Facebook was built on. And it was like super manual. Anything you wanted to do, you have to do yourself. Any changes you have to, that happen, that Facebook would have to notify your phone, your computer, everything was done manually. So you can imagine this was a lot of manual work. It was just almost impossible to maintain. But to get more specific about this data, uh, I'm gonna, like in the next slide, we're going to discuss exactly why MVC uh, and Backbone.js simply were not fit for this kind of thing. But one thing that I also want to mention was that React provided auto binding. So if you ever make a change to your view, let's say you add a friend, this would immediately modify the model, and then the model in your back end would say, okay, Yusuf has just added a friend. So uh, this kind of compounded the problem. So can you imagine if I try to make a change for my phone, and then I make another change for my tablet, for example. And they both are using the MVC pattern. Well, if I have just two views or two ways to manipulate my data, maybe it won't be such a problem. So I'll just use my phone, modify the data, and then a little bit later, I check my tablet, data modified, everything is great. So if you have a small number of screens, then typically a user would interact with a view somehow, and then that view would manipulate the model, and then once that model is updated, it will basically update the view to the user. So if you hit add friend, a moment later, you should see in your added friends or your friend requests, you would see uh, that it's been updated on your screen. So it's totally fine if you have one model and maybe two views. But expectation versus reality. It was a little bit more like that. So you had a computer, a phone, a tablet, and also so many different users communicating with so many different parts of Facebook. The user.json object over time for Facebook became so sophisticated and so complicated that MVC was simply no longer a valid option. As you can see, this is difficult to maintain. Data all of a sudden becomes like spaghetti code and it's very difficult to track what is modifying, uh, wh which view is modifying your models and which view needs to be updated. And this whole thing is written manually in Backbone.js, then it even compounds the problem even more. So clearly, this was the limit of the MVC architecture. So what's the solution? What did Bill Fisher do? He recognized that this is the problem, and he said, hey guys, MVC is gonna lead to this big mess. What solution did Bill come up with? Well, he created something called Flux. Flux is just a design pattern. It's a way to build your app uh, based on the data within your app. So, Flux is just a, de a design pattern or an architecture. It's not really like fixed code or like a library or anything like that. It's just a set of principles and a way to pass data within your app that will avoid the pitfalls or the limitations of the MVC pattern. So these are the three basic principles of Flux. They achieve what's called unidirectional data flow. Data will only flow in one direction. So for example, we have data coming in from the back end. Let's say it, this is your UI, so you're logged in, you have the ability to go to home or profile or you know, any other part of the app. But data will always flow from the back end to your app. If you wanna make changes to your app, they would have to be triggered through events. In MVC, it would basically, it was like a, a two directional way. So your app can modify the data directly, so that's one way, but also the data can modify your app. So it was kind of like all over the place, going up and down. But the first and most important principle of Flux is that data should flow only in one direction. Data comes from one way, from the back end to your device, and goes up the other way. Events go to your back end to modify the data through what's called actions. And Bill, when he proposed this model, he basically created an example as a reference, and then he said, hey guys, so here's my example code. Take that and build your own patterns, but this is gonna fix your problem. And then, 
11 patterns emerged based on flux. Uh, and there was just so many different ways to do it. It does fix the problem, but there's so many different ways to do it. Until another engineer joined Facebook in 2015, and he created the next big thing since Flux, based on Flux. That was Dan Abramoff, and he created Redux. Are you familiar with Redux? Anybody here? Okay, a little bit surprising. Redux is the most popular framework used for React and React Native state management. It's the most popular implementation of Flux. And once again, uh, remember that Flux was just a general concept. It's just a design pattern. Redux is the best implementation of that design pattern. And we're going to talk a little bit about how exactly Redux works. But as soon as he explained this pattern to engineers at Facebook, convinced them that MVC was no longer good for what they're doing, and they switched to Redux, all their problems went away. And this is why Redux is now the most popular pattern available for React and React Native developers. I guess because we have zero React and React Native developers, nobody here knows about Redux, except for you over there. <laughs> and you as well, and another one there. So, <laughs> so Redux is very popular in the React and React Native world. This is a simple diagram of Redux. As you can see, data flows in one direction only. So it's always a full circle. There's no going that way. It's always gonna go this way. So let's say this is like your phone and you maybe, uh, you wanna send a message or you wanna modify your data somehow. It's not gonna go to your data right away. Instead, it's gonna create an action. It's gonna be handled by a dispatcher. This is kind of like the controller. It's like the person or like, a, well, it's not a person like the part of your application that acts as the regulator, if you will. So if any actions come in, they are queued and they're not triggered kind of like all randomly. So this, because data only flows in one direction, you will never have an issue with race conditions. You're never gonna have an issue with any of your views uh, conflicting with other views or with any store. And the three principles of flux still stand, which is you have a single source of truth, your state is read-only, so whenever the state is updated, the state generally would live here, it's read-only. It's passed this way. The view cannot write to it. It can only read it. It can trigger an action, and then the action will go to the dispatcher, modify the data, and give it a new version of the data. But it would not be able to modify that data, because data only flows unidirectionally, as we talked about. This is a simple diagram of flux. We have an, an action from our view, goes to our dispatcher, goes through some process, the middleware is like, okay, I need to add a friend, I need to notify that friend, I need to do a bunch of stuff. And then it goes to what's called a reducer. That reducer is actually what gets the action done. And it's like, okay, state, you have to change. And then when the state changes, your view gets changed. But everything happens in one direction. There is no going that direction. So basically items come here, go that way, and then out to the reducer, to the state, and out through the on-change again. But you never go back, you only move forward. In the parallel world of Google, Google created Dart, and this was announced actually as an improvement and a replacement to JavaScript. So it wasn't really accepted by the community as much. The majority of the community basically stuck with JavaScript. Uh, but Google was like, I don't care. <laughs> they rebuilt their entire, uh, their core applications using Dart. So JWT is like an engine that's used to create Gmail, for example. It used to be built in Java and it would compile to JavaScript. They rewrote the whole thing in Dart. But also, this was a big one. They rewrote AdWords and AdSense uh, completely in Dart. These are like the two most profitable products at Google. And they've been built from scratch uh, using Dart. And these products generate over $80 billion of revenue a year. So Google really kind of went all in with Dart. And in the spirit of going all in with Dart, they created Angular Dart. So for people who work with web, I'm sure you're familiar with Angular JS. There's actually another version of it called Angular Dart. And for all the services of Google, now that, now that Google is Full, well, they're really trying to push for Dart internally, so they have their back end written in Dart, their front end written in Angular, and they had a problem of sharing this code between Angular Darts and Darts. 
So how do they solve that? This was the birth of the block pattern. Anybody heard of it? Yes. It's arguably a, a very popular pattern in the Flutter world. Uh, up until Provider came out, it was kind of the go-to. And it's very similar in that data flows in one direction only. So we have our Dart back end on one side, and we have our Angular Dart, which is the front end, and the other side. And there's kind of a black box in the middle. It takes the data from the back end, applies some kind of process, and then creates a stream of data that can be displayed to your front end. And so Block heavily capitalizes on streams. It uses streams kind of to their limits. Uh, and the block pattern, because it provides a separation between the UI and the data, so our front end will be in Angular Darts in the case of Google, and the back end was written in Dart, so it provides a clean separation between both. They found this to be a, a useful pattern and they passed it on to the Flutter package. And this is how we got the block pattern for state management. Then, scoped model came out. Scope model was based on block. It was actually uh, extracted from the Fuchsia code base, which is the new operating system uh, from Google. And uh, it's based on block, but it's, it's actually a little bit more powerful than that. This is a quote from the scope model package page. It's a set of utilities that allow you to easily pass data from a, a, a data model in the parent widget down to its descendants. So it kind of works a little bit similar to inherited widget, but it doesn't have a problem with streams. So if you remember everything that we said about inherited widgets, that your data has been lifted outside of your app to the top of your app, well, a scope model does the same thing, but it can also handle streams. So it's kind of like an inherited widget with upgrades. So, this is an explanation of the scope model, very similar to the diagram we talked about earlier. Instead of an inherited widget, you can have a scoped model that you built at the top of your app. This could be in your material app, your home, or your scaffold, the highest point that you want that data to live, so that any point beneath that will have access to the scope model and will have that data. In order to, to build this into your app, you need to do three steps. You need to build your model first, so, for example, our model could be a user object. And then, I'm gonna wrap my material app, which is like the highest widget in my app, using that scoped model. And any widget that's interested in learning about that user needs to implement what's called a scoped model descendant, or like a child of the scope model that would require to communicate with the scope model. Uh, actually, it doesn't come with dependency injection. This is a mistake. So keep in mind, uh, we're going to talk about what does come with dependency injection, but I think this is copied over from the slide. But first, let's talk about, let's show you a quick diagram of how scope model works. So this is your, your hierarchy. As we talked about, scope, mo scope model will be the root, the very highest point of your hierarchy. Then let's say a user clicks on a button to increment the value one. It would go to the model, increment the button, and then that would go to the scope model and say, hey, redraw all your children widgets because the data has been updated. So it's much like the inherited widget that we talked about earlier, but it provides you with an extra thing which is it can handle streams gracefully. You no longer have to do it yourself and you're not gonna run into memory leaks or crashes. Then came the provider package. So actually, Google started out by creating what's called a provide package. Not provider, provide. And they were really focusing on building uh, something robust, something new. It was mostly built on the scope model, uh, but added to it the dependency injection. But their implementation was okay. And then Remy Rousselet comes, comes along, creates the provider pattern, which was more robust, cleaner, and just more accepted by the community. So Google was like, cool, let's use your pattern. And they literally just dumped their provide package and, and started using the provider uh, package built by Remy Rousselet. And the provider it, pattern is actually 
almost the same as scoped model. So if we go back to the diagram, it's the same idea, but it comes with dependency injection. Dependency injection gives you the ability to provide your model to any of those widgets without having to pass it around. So basically, provider has all the benefits of everything that we talked about so far. It gives you the ability to modify the data, it gives you the ability to read the data, it gives you the ability to update your UI whenever the data changes, it gives you the ability to work with streams, and it comes with dependency injection out of the box as opposed to scope model. So, so many different options. Which one do we pick? In the React, React Native world, we said Redux seems to be the most popular, most robust option. That's what Facebook is using, and that's what the majority of the community is using. Uh, but what about in the Flutter world? Well, remember, inherited widget is given to you for free. As in, it comes with your SDK without implementing anything else. Not to say it's the best tool, but to say that this is like the foundational component that you can use to create your own patterns. If you want to do something simple, you can just use it. This comes with the SDK. You don't need a third party package to use inherited widget. But as you might have guessed, provider is probably the way you want to go. Provider was recommended at Google I.O. 2019. It's part of what's called the Flutter Favorite Program. I have a quote from the website here. The aim of the Flutter fa Favorite Program is to identify packages and plugins that you should first consider when building your app. So whenever you want to build a new app, if you have any kind of scalability in mind, I would strongly suggest you use the provider pattern because it does everything that the scope model does and it adds to it dependency injection. Uh, and also, this is something they mentioned in the IO 19, the block pattern was, uh, has proved to be too sophisticated or too complex for simple applications. So there you have it. Those are the most popular state management solutions that exist today. For React Native, we talked about Redux and how that came into existence. And for Flutter, we talked about how Provider came into existence all the way from an inherited widget, which does the most basic inheritance that we need for our whole widget tree, all the way up to the Provider pattern, which has all the things that you need, including handling streams, updating your UI, being able to manipulate that stream, and uh, it comes with dependency injection. So there you have it. That was a brief history of state management. We talked about what, how the tool is available to you if you're a React Native developer or a Flutter developer. Uh, if you're a beginner to Flutter, Provider would be a great option. It just kind of takes the whole thing out of the process. And uh, in fact, in the second talk, we're going to be building on this. We're going to be using the Provider pattern to build Flutter Connect, which is our app. It's a social network built from scratch based on all these concepts that we've been talking about. So you get some real life examples of how to use the provider pattern uh, in your app to, and uh, combined obviously with streams. So you'll be able to handle those streams gracefully and uh, yeah, it should be fairly straightforward. So that's it for the first talk. Uh, thank you very much. The, uh, the second talk once again is gonna be uh, continuing to build Flutter Connect. If you have not followed the instructions in the email, now, now would be a good time to do that. So uh, if you have any questions, we have 15 minutes before we start the, uh, the second talk. And uh, yes, so help yourself with some food. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Yes. OK, so um, I did some research on this, like comparing the block pattern to the provider. So, and there was no clear answer where you would use one or the other. So. Well, once again, in Google I.O., they said that the block pattern seems to be too sophisticated for the needs of the average uh, user. So not to say that one is like an alternative to the other. Remember that the block pattern was created to solve a very specific problem. You had two interfaces. You had like the dark back end and the angular dark front end. It's like a black box between them. Whereas provider is more of a, a full-fledged solution that allows you to pass data from your tree hierarchy from top to bottom. It used to be that they recommended the block pattern. I started to learn it and use it within my app. It was confusing as hell. That's, that's, that's the truth. Yeah. Uh, and then the provider came along. And as you're going to see in the second talk, provider is actually really straightforward. You literally just wrap the data that you want in the model, put it in the top of your app, and it becomes available to all your widgets. But you can write a very advanced application. Oh, absolutely. You, well, you can write an advanced application with both. Any of the patterns that we talked about today, you can use safely, correctly, but each one of them has some kind of limitation. 
and provider has addressed all these limitations to give you kind of like an all-in-one solution. If you want to do just one thing, let's say you, the data that you have has no streams. Although once again, I recommend you know, learning about streams, using them because they're a very powerful component. But let's say your app has just like a, some database, you're just displaying some data, you don't really have any streams. Maybe you don't really some, need something as sophisticated as the provider pattern. Maybe you could just get by with the inherited widget. And once again, inherited widget is just as good as stateful and stateless widgets. They're just available to you uh, and from the get-go. Whereas uh, more sophisticated patterns will require that you import the package into, into your app. Uh, but I would say if you're starting out, or even if you're experienced, I strongly suggest looking into the provider pattern as your first choice. Uh, but if it seems that it's overkill, you can always downgrade to one of the other patterns that we mentioned. Any other questions? Yes. Norris? Not that I know of. Uh, so keep in mind, this stuff evolves all the time, right? Whatever we think is a, is a great pattern today, tomorrow we trash it. We're like, that was the worst thing ever. Whenever we come up with something better. Uh, at this point, the requirements in the mobile world, especially in the Flutter world, seem to be in line with the provider pattern. I've used it myself. It was pretty straightforward. I had all the data that I needed available immediately to my app. And as you're gonna see in the second talk, you can, you can basically use it to provide your, the data to, your, to any part of your app without that much code. Yes? Redux and? Provider. Provider. So uh, that's actually a really good question because you can also reuse Redux in Flutter. There's a package for Flutter called Redux. So I would say if you understand both patterns really well and you understand your requirements really well and you think that one pattern would be more suitable than the other, Redux, in my opinion, is a little bit, um, it's more geared towards like the JavaScript, the JSX world. But once again, there is a full package for, for Flutter that uses the same, uh, the same concept. Uh, I would say if you're working in the Flutter world, stick with the provider unless for some reason uh, you have a preference or maybe you're used to Redux. A lot of people are just used to it and they just, that's what they want to work with. If you're working with React Native, obviously there's no provider and Redux would obviously be the way to go. It's what you, what's used now to build Facebook. It's also what's being used by the majority of the React and Re React Native community. So I would say, just my recommendation, if you're in the React Native world, Redux is great. If you're in the Flutter world, provided, is, provider is great. Any other, yes? Good question. So actually, what you're doing is what provider is aiming to do. You're using an observable pattern within the, or with a block pattern. So if you use provider, you won't have to do any of that. I'm not saying go change your code. Uh, in fact, I'm generally, you know, I'm for if what you have works, great. You don't need to change it because you can get into a slippery slope of just rewriting your entire application when it works. If it works and you, you, you didn't run into any limitation, then you know, you're doing the right thing. But if you start using streams or you start using something and then you reach the limitation of your app, I would suggest looking into you know, one of these other solutions like provider. Uh, I, would, I would suggest just provider. Like scope model was kind of a step to get to provider. So if your current requirements are uh, sufficient or, or the, the block plus observer pattern are sufficient for you, don't change it. Otherwise, absolutely. Feel free to explore the provider pattern. Any other questions? Yes. If you use uh, the provider package, do you have to handle the streams uh, closing? So there's a method called dispose provided to you within the provider package. And you just basically, within that method, dispose your stream. So any stream that you're working with, make sure to dispose it in the, in the master dispose method of the provider. Uh, yes. The yes, of course. You just have to tell it which stream to dispose. Uh, yeah, but it does it for you. Uh, as in, like, it will call it at the right time. I think one more. Yes. No worries. No worries. Sure. Uh, more information about streams? The streaming links. So I'm actually recording it right now. As soon as the recording is done, I'm going to upload it. Uh, I, the plan was to stream this from the beginning, but we're just going to upload a recorded copy so you can listen to the whole thing. It's going to also include the slides. And if there's any part of this that you didn't understand, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. 
No problem. All right, thanks very much. Please help yourself to some food.